Okay, we're towards the conclusion of the second of the Amida. We say that Hashem resurrects the dead, resurrects those who were sleeping in the dust. And we speak about his ability. We conclude, who is comparable to you? The one who possesses power. Powers, meaning to be able to bring about resurrection. It's one of a kind of power to do this. There's no other entity or power that's able to bring do this. You know, it's interesting. You're able to, um, we speak about in vitro, that they take the sperm and they grow things in a Petri dish or whatever it is, or they speak about cloning to actually create a human being or to inseminate a woman that she should conceive. But everybody's in agreement. It's not even a consideration. Once a person dies, he cannot be brought back. Impossible. If it's determined he's no longer alive, that he expires, whatever expiring means, whether you believe in the soul, the soul leaves the body, or life comes to an end, it is impossible. There's no historical reading record that that person can be brought back. As advanced as medicine becomes, to take life that ended and restore it, impossible. Maybe they believe they could create life in terms on the evolutionary level. But once a life existed, to restore it, to bring it back, impossible. So that that God is able to resurrect the dead, a body that decomposes to dust, and bring the body back, take that original soul and reinfuse it into that body through recreating the body, which we're not even talking about what is the state of being of resurrection, what that person will be. Micha Mocha, who is comparable to you? Bal Gvuros, the one who possesses all powers. This is a one of a kind of power. No entity is able to do such a thing. Even the pagans, whatever they believe, these deities, but to recreate a human being, that's nothing. Impossible. They believe there's a God of fertilization. They worship the God of fertility. But that's to bring about conception. But resurrection, Micha Mocha Balgvaros, who is like you, the one who possesses all the powers, Mal, not Balgvaro in the singular. This encompasses all power. This is the all powerful. Umi Domaluch. We're going to define it even greater. No one has a semblance of your ability. Now, let's talk about resurrection. What actually happens? The Ramchal, Rabbi Lutzato, writes in one of his works, if we say that if a person does even a mitzvah, the most minute mitzvah, the deservingness, the reward for that mitzvah is so unlimited, there's not enough years and time or ability within a finite context to reward the person for that mitzvah, which you performed. The word mega is an understatement. The world itself does not have the capacity to accommodate the reward for even the most minute mitzvah. The Talmud tells us that if a child lives to the age where he's only able to say Amen, Amen is an acronym for Amen Kel Melech Nemon, acknowledging God for being the faithful God. Just for saying Amen, the child, although he's a minor, will merit a share in the world to come. The Amen brings about enough of a result, generates enough of a spiritual energy that that child will be worthy 
to have a relationship with God, to be part of the world to come. So if a person does multiple mitzvos, commandments, observes the positive, takes initiatives, refrains from the negative, which is a demonstration of one's fear of God, which is a positive commandment. How do you quantify that level of accomplishment? It's unquantifiable. The soul itself, although it's finite, relative to God, God is infinite. As I said, even the greatest angel cannot fathom the makeup of the Jewish soul. So the Jewish soul, after it's been infused with a level of energy, which is unquantifiable energy, because for that, those mitzvos, the only infusion which a soul is able to be infused with is an infusion of spirituality, which is only a result of doing a mitzvah. Positive, initiative, or refraining from the negative, which is an expression of fear of God, reverence of God. That's what it is. If the soul would be infused with that, which it is infused with that, and that's its share in the world to come, the level of infusion, how much infusion, the quality of the infusion will determine the dimension of that soul. Initially, the soul is all potential. When you infuse it, now the potential is actualized and the soul becomes a different entity not recognized as originally was when initially was created before man took initiative to do, make the right choice. If that soul, initially when it's infused in the body, it's a soul which hasn't been actualized, it hasn't been infused, it hasn't expanded yet. It doesn't raise, radiate yet, it doesn't pulsate at this level which borders on the infinite. If it's infused in the body at that point, it's not a problem. But if the level of infusion is so beyond being fathomable and the soul ultimately expands, radiates, and that soul in that expansive context is in the body, where men would not have choice, a human being would not have choice. Why does a person sin? Why is a person inclined to sin? And choice is to rein in on the physical and suppress the physical inclination and to do what God wants. It's a tug of war between the physical and the spiritual. It's only a tug of war because in the state that the soul is in, it doesn't manifest itself because it hasn't been actualized due to the infusion of the choices which were made because if it was infused, if those infusions manifest themselves in expansion, in radiance, the soul would spiritualize the physicality of the body. And once the soul overwhelms the body with, with its spiritual infusion, the body no longer functions as a physical entity. It's like we find Moshe Rabbeinu Although he was a physical being, he radiated holiness. As we read in last week's reading, the, radi the radiance was so intense and overwhelming, people could not look at his face. They didn't have the capacity to deal with that level of holiness. He had to cover his face with a mask that they should not see his face. And that's without the soul expanding as it would be expand in the world to come. Every Jew, if that soul would expand due to the radiant infusion of the mitzvah, the soul will become, as I said, there's no other word to you, would become so mega, so expand, expansive and overwhelming, the body could not which is finite, cannot stand up to the soul. So what does God do? 
although we do many things, good things in our lives, God suppresses the effect of that infusion. He suppresses it. Because if he would not suppress it, the human being would not have free choice. Because the person instantaneously would be spiritualized. Even for one mitzvah, the body is finite, the soul is infinite. The water is on the infinite. Mitzvah borders on the infinite. If you, if you pit finite versus bordering an infinite, what has the upper hand? Something borders on the infinite. Therefore, God does not allow the soul to be impacted, to expand, and to become spiritualized in its true potential, because that would immediately disrupt the whole concept and undermine free choice. Man would no longer have free, free choice. So what happens when a person, the soul, ascends to the world to come? All that spirituality that was suppressed throughout a person's lifetime due to all those infusions, being in a spiritual realm, being in the soul world, now that soul expands at a level which is not to be fathomed. And the soul is not recognized any longer as that original soul that it was infused in the body when the, when the person was born, as an infant. Because initially, when the child was born, it's all potential. Now it's been actualized. Actualized, it's a different dimension. It's a different realm of existence. When that soul is now reinfused in the body after it's resurrected, which it's resurrected as pure matter, because the evil of the tree of knowledge remains in the ground and all that's recreated is the body, which is pure. What happens when that soul is infused in that body? It's overtaken by that soul at the mega level of a lifetime's accomplishment. We have no idea what that body is going to look like. To have the capacity to contain this entity, which is not to be described due to one's level of accomplishments throughout a lifetime. But that is what the, so resurrection is not only bringing the physicality of the person back, it's reinfusing that physicality, which is now comprised of pure matter with a soul that's been infused with unfathomable infusions. As we said, a child who answers only once in a lifetime merits a share in the world to come. And even for that, there's not enough capacity in this existence to reward the person for that. So a lifetime of doing positive and negative commandments, refraining from them. What is the level of that accomplishment? It's beyond, beyond, it's something which cannot be computed on any, 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 uh, any, any system of calculation. And every Jew who merits that resurrection there's a level of transformation which happens, which is not imaginable. So it's not only bringing the person back to existence, but it's the reinfusion. Even it's no longer a composite. Composite, somebody's made up of two things. The body loses its identity, it's totally subsumed and consumed. With, ho with holiness that the person is no longer recognized as a, as a physical being. The person becomes a spiritual being. I'll give you an example. The Mishnah Pirkei Avos tells us that there were a number of miracles which took place every day in the temple. On Yom Kippur, when all the Jews would go into the sanctuary to observe the high priest doing the service of Yom Kippur. And they would stand erect. They would be pressed together to a point that when you would lift your feet, you'd be suspended. That's how tightly they pressed together. When they would hear the high priest, the Kohen Godel, pronouncing the name of God, 
they would prostrate themselves full length and be enough room for full prostration. One moment they're pressed to the point there's no what we call wiggle room. Not as much as an iota. The moment they hear the name, the name of God pronounced by the high priest, everyone bows at full prostration. And they even have more room than the, the length of the bodies. They have four cubits. Because when you prostrate yourself, you confess on your kipper, and the, God doesn't want your fellow to hear your, your confession. Because it's something which it's embarrassing for a person to admit and somebody should overhear what your confession is. Now, the question I always say, when you would stand outside the temple, when the people would prostrate themselves, do you think the walls expanded? Did you see all of a sudden the walls move outward? The walls remained where they were, and yet there was enough room for expansion, for prostration. How, how, how exactly, how does this process come about? The concept of time and space is only limited to the physical. Within the spiritual realm, there's no such thing as time and space. It's a continuum. There's no limitation. We talk about eternity, unlimited existence. Although the temple was made of physical matter, was made of marble, of stone, but what was its context? Its physical makeup was, was material, but its context was spiritual. Being spiritual, it has an unlimited capacity. So visually speaking, it has physical characteristics. There's specifications, there's limitation. But in terms of its capacity, since its context is spiritual, it's considered, it's unlimited. Therefore, there's no question. When they acknowledge the pronouncement of God's name to offer their negation to that, and the total negation is prostration, it's not a problem. Because its context is spiritual. In spiritual, there is no, it's, it has no relevance to the finite. There's no limitation. Therefore, they're able to prostrate themselves. We say that the seventh day of the week, which is the holiest day of the year, it's called Shabbos. Kodesh Lochem, it's holy for you. And this week's reading, Chalemos Yumos, and has such a degree of holiness that if you violate the Shabbos, it carries a death penalty. Shabbos, the seventh day of the week is Me'en on the And as a semblance of the world to come, if you look at the day and you evaluate it in the physical sense, sunrise, sunset, nightfall, it's no different than any other day of the week. What happens on that day in the physical setting is the same physical setting. Yet, the Talmud tells us, based on verses, that the seventh day of the week is has a semblance of the world to come. Therefore, Jew has an expanded spirituality. Once a Jew's soul expands, has a greater capacity on Shabbos, if the Jew observes the Shabbos. It's a different reality. So in terms of time, it's the same time, same 24-hour period, which is a day. Night, nighttime, daytime. Same as all the other six days. But what's its context? Its context is it's spiritual. Therefore, God enters into existence on the seventh day. And that spiritualizes it and brings to a level, there's nothing comparable to that. That's exactly what Shabbos is. Today, when we do the mitzvah, we are spiritualized. It activates our spiritual senses. As we have physical senses, nerve endings, we have spiritual nerve endings. A person is spiritualized, he's sensitive to things which are not obvious to, or to the ordinary person. But in terms of being overwhelmed due to that spiritual infusion, 
the effect is less than infinitesimal. Because if it was to any degree, our value has been lost. It was no longer a context of free choice. The moment that happens, we no longer have free choice. A person naturally will only do the will of God because all that exists is only the imprint and the effect and influence of the soul and the good deeds we do. So we're talking about bringing a soul, reinfusing in the body. Micha mocha bal gros. Who is comparable to you? The one who possesses all power. Gvur is power. Umi domeloch. You have many people. You have many levels of exceptional intelligence. Even artificial intelligence. But it's all within the realm of intelligence. When we talk about God, umi domeloch. It's a different dimension of existence. Nothing has even a semblance of who God is. Umi, who's like you? Umi domoch. There's no one who even has a semblance of what you do. What's that? Melech Memis. God that we refer to. Taking life, he's Melech. The king decides who lives, who dies. But when a mortal king decides that, that's taking life, allowing one to continue to live. Melech is may miss. The mortal king also has the ability to take, give a decision, a person's life should be taken. But to bring back to life, no king could do that. That's resurrection. They don't even consider that within the realm of any possibility. That once life has ended, to restore that life, it's not possible. But Melech me You, God, are a king who takes life, umechayeh. As we explained, when we speak about God, he causes a person to die. Why must you die? A person's worthy. Why should he die? He hasn't even sinned in his lifetime. Talmud tells us that four people never sinned. Why did they have to die? Because every human being is a descent of Adam, as we disclaimed. Every human being is tinged with the evil of the, of the tree of knowledge. You cannot be an eternal being if you have any degree, any trace of that evil. Because the value of eternity is to have a relation with God. God will not have a relationship with anything which has a representation of that evil. So, Melech Meimis, you are a king who takes life. But what's the value of taking life? Umechayeh. You're taking life only to resurrect it. Taking life has no value unto itself. If the man is worthy, if the person is worthy, why is he taking the life? The answer is because he's mechayeh. Because the objective of existence is ultimate reward, and that's eternity. Therefore, he has to take life to give life. The process is death, decomposition, and then resurrection. So he's the king who takes life for the sake of, not he could just take life. The mortal king also takes life. But the taking is for the sake of mechayeh, to bring back to life, to restore the life. And the restoration of that life is what? That's at that special level where the body and soul function eternally as this new entity, which was the original intent of creation. That the human being, as a beneficiary of his actions, should be able to cleave to God, both body and soul, in this context. Umat speak Yeshua. But when is it going to happen? God puts many things throughout history. And God guides history 
things evolve and happen based on man's choices. The objective is we have to get to home plate. We have to reach our destination. What's destination? Resurrection's destination. That's the end of time. We have to be worthy to merit that. Let's say mankind would always be going on that straight and narrow path, always doing good deeds. We would have reached there thousands of years ago. But man, unfortunately, took detours. And we backtracked. And we deviated. But God says, as we say in the Yichrod, Atzash Shem Hisakum, God's program will, will succeed no matter what. Even if you have to take a detour, go out of your way, endless time. So there are many events which take place in existence only because we made choices which didn't allow it to happen sooner. We could have taken the, state, the straight road, but what do we do? We destroyed that pathway, so God has to create a different approach to be able to arrive at the destination. So God is continues to say, Yeshua. He plants the salvation. He puts along the roadway continuously aspects to bring about the ultimate salvation. But only God could do that. Because only God could bring about the ultimate level of perfection, which is what? Which is resurrection. It's the re-infusing of the soul into the body at that special level. You know, there's a question which is asked, which we discussed. One of the blessings we ask for healing. We ask God to heal a person has an illness, a very serious illness, and we pray for recovery. Refine Hashem in the heal us and let us be healed. Bring about salvation and it should be a permanent salvation. Person goes to the doctor and he has evaluation and has a, has a diagnosis. The person's diagnosed with a very serious illness. Doctor says the only way we could deal with it, very extreme measure, which is very painful. And the doctor says, this procedure is proven, you will recover and you'll live quality of life for the next 50 years. But the procedure is a painful procedure to bring about that result. And the pain will last for just a few hours. And he begs the doctor, please don't do the procedure. Let me just die. Is this person a stable person, a rational person? Anybody understands, and this is proven, guaranteed, it will succeed. And the person begs the doctor not to give him this medication or this procedure, which will restore his life fully as if he was never ever sick. What is the concept of punishment? Punishment is a rehabilitative process. It's atonement. So if a person has an illness, nobody's perfect. As we said, even the greatest tzaddik is not perfect. So any illness anybody experiences is due to what? It's not due to we're doing too many mitzvahs. So we always have a question. This other person is endlessly worse than this person. He's as healthy and he's never seen a bad day in his life. And the tzaddik... He, doesn't, he hasn't seen a good day in his life. Infirm health, failing health. But nobody's perfect. 
even the tzaddik's not perfect. God decides that tzaddik has to pay his debt in this world. And the tzaddik's happy to pay his debt. That when he leaves this existence, he leaves debt free. The other person not being that level of tzaddik, God has a different program for that person. But whoever is ill and we pray for healing, even the tzaddik prays for healing, why pray for healing? It's totally contrary to any logical, rational thought process if you believe and understand that the process of illness is a rehabilitative process. So why do we pray for healing? We're begging the the ultimate doctor. I'm God, your healer. Don't provide the healing. How do we understand it? But he's Matzviach Yeshua. Many things that happened to us throughout history. Why was the second temple destroyed? Unwarranted hate. It's not because we were too holy and we didn't need a temple. We were unworthy, that's why the temple was taken. The Jerusalem Talmud says that every Generation where the Beis Hamidrash was not rebuilt, it was as if it was destroyed. Why? Because since it was destroyed because of unwarranted hate, it's clear we haven't corrected the problem. Because if we would have restored ourselves, that that failing is no longer among us, the temple would have been rebuilt. So since it's within our ability to make the correction, if we didn't make the correction, the generation is held culpable for destroying it. Having the ability to restore and we choose not to restore, we're responsible for, for the non-restoration. So all the problems, the pogroms, the appeals, the persecutions, the discrimination, everything is due to what? It's due because it's part of an atonement process. It's what we call wake-up call. You know, we're in a trance. We have to be shaken out of that so-called trance to be sensitive to the reality of what we have to deal with. Hashem is Matzmich Yeshua. He's always planting whatever is needed to bring about that ultimate salvation. All these various things. They tell the story, the Arizal, who was the greatest Kabbalist since Rabbi Shimei Choy, the 16th century, he lived in Svat, and he was walking with his students, which were all great Kabbalists. And the, as they're walking out in the fields, and he's teaching them all the secrets of existence, they see a very simple Svartic Jew with his donkey, and the donkey's lying on its side and the donkey broke its leg. And the only source of livelihood for this poor, simple Sephardic Jew is the donkey. It breaks its leg and the donkey has to be killed, has to be destroyed. His only means of livelihood in a moment is taken from him. He raises his eyes to Hashem. He says, Ishtabach bore olam. Baruch Hashem, it's your will. Let it be an atonement. With absolute faith, purity of faith. And then he goes and he lifts up a stone, a boulder. What does he find under the boulder? Jewels. Which, had, which was endlessly more valuable than herds and herds of donkeys. Flocks of donkeys. So the Arizal says to his students, what this man merited, we couldn't merit. Why? Because his faith is so absolutely pure. It's not because he understands. He accepts God's will, doesn't even question it. It's not I have to figure it out and say, it's in my best interest. He accepts it, he embraces it, makes a statement. That statement is a sanctification of God's name. God immediately compensates him, immediately. Because he understood, as the Svartic Jews say, kapara. It's an atonement. The whole value of anything 
It's all part of the atonement process. But all these issues is Matzmich Yeshua. God is planting all along the way all the necessary components which ultimately will bring the redemption. We have to meet a certain critical level of suffering. Once we pay off the debt, then it's going to happen. Chavetz Chaim believed that World War I was the beginning of the Messianic times. Why? Because the Talmud tells us, based on a verse in Prophets, that we have a debt to pay. And God deals with the Jews differently, deals with the nations of the world. And it says, what is it analogous to? A king gives a very large loan to the, a person who's most intimate with him, a person he loves. And he gives the same amount of money to a stranger who's one of subjects. And he says to his intimate friend, because this loan, although you have all these years to pay it, I want you to stop paying it immediately. Why? Because if you pay it immediately, when the loan's going to be due, you'll have to make one less payment and you're debt free. This other person, he can do what he wants. But if he's delinquent on paying that debt and he can't pay the debt, I will destroy him. You, I don't want to destroy. You, I love. So I'm giving a payment schedule to pay it out over time that when the last payment is due, you'll be able to make that payment. So the Chavetz Chaim explains World War I, which was the precursor to World War II, was already the payment of the last, the last payment of that debt. Sometimes the last payment of the debt, you really have to make that extra effort because now we have to wipe the record clean that there's not a trace of debt. So sometimes that's the tremendous suffering, tremendous pain. And that's what's called Ikhvid Mashiach. It's called Chevli Moshiach. It's the birth pangs of the coming of Messiah. What's the birth pangs? A woman, when she goes to labor, she has this movement, contractions. The unborn child is in, a, in her womb. Every time she has a contraction, it pushes the child closer to, to actually coming into being a human being. Those contractions are very painful. And as it gets closer, they become, they become more frequent. It reaches a climax of pain. And finally, the child's pushed out, the mother is relieved. No more pain. That's the birth pangs of Mashiach. It's the last payment of debt. It's painful. But God wants that debt to be paid because once it's paid, the salvation comes immediately. God's glory is immediately, and we are proclaimed to be God's people. We're fully rehabilitated. Resurrection happens. That's why we have all the birth pangs of, that's why it's referred to the birth pangs of the coming of Mashiach. As the birth pangs, the contractions pushes the child out, the last element of suffering is to pay off that debt that ultimately we should be the beneficiaries of that salvation. So God is mamis. Why does he take life? To be Mechaya, to resurrect the life. And what, what, and what's the precursor to that? Matzmich Yeshua. He plants various things in history that ultimately we should have that salvation. As I said, we don't understand why was there? Why was Hitler able to kill six million Jews, a million innocent children, suffering which is beyond? Thank God we can't even relate to the level of suffering that these people what, what they went through. As is only God knows. But ultimately, in retrospect, when we see the truth, in retrospect, we'll understand everything perfectly. Why all those plantings and all those signposts all along the way when necessary to come to the destination. This is Umatzmich Yeshua. He plants the various events in history that ultimately we should have the salvation. And we have no question. You are faithful that you will resurrect the dead. It hasn't happened. 
And I always say, thank God we believe in God. Because if we did not believe in God and we say life is random and we see the craziness of this world and what's going on, there's no rhyme, there's no reason. It's insanity and beyond insanity. What, 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 should, we do? what, what should we do? Dig a hole, go into it and just cover it over and forget about life. But if you believe in God and understand there's nothing random, everything that happens is because God's allowing it to happen to what happens. And everything has a positive aspect to it. Because only through these various events are we going to arrive at the destination. Although they may be painful. But the key is we have to arrive. You're faithful. You will resurrect the dead. And because you're faithful, and that's not even a question, therefore everything has meaning. Once everything has meaning, as we acknowledge God for good fortune, we acknowledge God for tragedy, although it's tragic, we say, we say, God is the true judge. It's only because he's Nemon, because he's faithful and truthful, that he will resurrect the dead, which ultimately is what is the objective, and that is the ultimate destination.